Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you again for being here for our, what are we at, fifth talk in our series on the Mino World after a Mino World Cup. Um, I am very thankful for uh, that we can all come together. I know the last few weeks have been very tough, and it's good for us as a community to just come together and have a chat about some things and, and, and think about other things. <laughs> um, I'm very glad to welcome Dr. Charlotte Lissa here today. Um, Dr. Lissa is a researcher at the University of Oslo. Uh, she's pro previously been um, a researcher in the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice working on uh, refugees, specifically in, in Saudi. Um, she has, she's probably at the forefront of the, the thought and scholarly interest on women's football in the Gulf, having written specifically on uh, women's football in Qatar, uh, focusing on Saudi, and is now part of a pro project called FORM, right, which is um, football, basically looking at football and religion in the Middle East. Um, she's written a number of articles, both on women's football, football in the Gulf in general, but also on refugees from the Gulf and related to the Gulf. Um, so I am very delighted to welcome her today to give the talk, Women and the Contested Field of Saudi Football. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm looking very much forward to all of your questions and engagement with my talk. Uh, first of all, before I start, let me just say that it feels a bit weird talking about football these days with everything going on in the Middle East and express my grief and anger about the loss of civilian lives in Palestine and Israel. Um, but uh, having said that, we're here to talk about something completely different today. Uh, that is football, football in Saudi Arabia. I've worked on this topic for a while. I first started actually in 2014 when I was a master's student. So I was doing an internship at the Saudi Embassy in Norway. And that gave me the opportunity to do a report on women's football and get in touch with women footballers in Saudi Arabia for the first time. So I then continued towards the PhD and did a field work on this in 2017. And have been continuing um, following this topic ever since, actually. So, the second season of the Nationwide Women's Football League in Saudi Arabia, organized by the Saudi Football Federation, it kicked off just three weeks ago in October. This league was launched in 2022, five years after authorities started issuing licenses for women's gyms and four years after the Saudi women were allowed to enter football stadiums around the kingdom. Playing in the league is some of the grand old Saudi football clubs. As you can see here, Jeddah clubs, Itihad, Al Ahli, Al Shabab, which is one of the oldest clubs in Riyadh, and giants Al Hilal and Al Nasr. And I, I'm gonna keep saying football, by the way, <laughs> but I'm, I'm Norwegian, I'm European, so bear with me. Um, but this is just the latest phase in the history of women's football in Saudi Arabia because masked behind such big brands are a number of pre-existing women's teams, some of which were established long before women's football became official in Saudi Arabia. So Eastern Flames, for example, based in Damam, was established already in 2006 and is the only independent women's team playing in the top division. Among the teams that have been acquired by other clubs are Al Yamama and Challenge, both established in 2017 by pioneering women, the two oldest teams in Riyadh, and the two only women's football teams in Saudi Arabia that has been active every season since their establishment, preparing the ground from which women's football is now flourishing. And I'll get back to these two teams in particular in this talk. So in this presentation, I will look beyond the most recent developments of women's football and beyond the state-oriented framework of sports washing that has become so dominant now recently. 
looking instead at the football that was already there, and more specifically, um, how women's football was regulated and perceived, but more than anything, how it was played. So a brief outline of the lecture. I will start off with an introduction of the history of football in Saudi Arabia, very briefly, and how to think of football in Saudi Arabia, football in the Middle East, or football in general. Um, I will then speak a little bit about the formal and informal opportunities for women's sports before the era of the Saudi 23rd edition, and that would be sports in general, because there wasn't really a discussion on football more specifically. Um, before I go on to perceptions of women's sports and then the long history of women's football in Saudi Arabia. Now, in the study of football politics and society in the Middle East, I would argue that two uh, specific paradigms stand out. Following the Arab Spring, researchers have brought attention to how football uh, functions as a site of protest. In repressive regimes where organized civil society is absent, the football stadium may function as an arena where social and political identities um, <clears throat> can be expressed, but also where political attitudes first emerge. This view facilitates an understanding of football as a possible outlet for political attitudes that are not otherwise demonstrated and that in turn could affect political developments. While on the other hand, state use of football as a foreign policy tool has lately been a very dominating topic in the study of the politics of sports in the Middle East. And the major focus here has been how states use football as a case, as a means to showcase itself uh, on the global state, influencing instead other states and international actors so since the awarding of the World Cup in Qatar, especially much effort has been put into understanding the politics of states and specifically Qatar's sports engagement. Both of these bodies of scholarship, the one concerned with football as a facilitator for social change or social protest, and that taking the angle of the state's use of football as a means of gaining influence in international relations, suggest that the football field in the Middle East is one where power is in play, <coughs> though not simply exhorted, but rather negotiated and contested. So moving to Saudi Arabia, also here where football is extremely popular, football has been a site of struggle, one where conflicts between competing ideas have been played out. The first official club in Saudi Arabia, al Ittihad, was founded in Jeddah in 1927, four years before the establishment of the present Saudi state. So in the early 1930s, colonial British archival material uh, revealed that some, there was some confusion as to whether or not football was uh, prohibited, but not for religious reasons, as a lot of other things uh, became pro prohibited at the time but rather because it was a place that brought young men together and out of a fear that the football clubs might function as a pretense for political activity or as centers for disloyalty. On the other hand, it was noted that the game was rapidly becoming popular and that the emir of the Hijaz region, later King Faisal himself, was actually playing. So, about 20 years later, uh, the Minister of Interior, Abdullah bin Faisal, so son of later King Faisal, but actually also the uncle of today's sports ministry in Saudi Arabia, allocated funds to develop sport under the Ministry of Interior, himself a very eager sports enthusiast. The Saudi Arabian Football Federation was established in 1956, eight years prior to the Saudi Arabian Olympic Committee, and the same year that the Football Federation was established, Saudi Arabia became a member of FIFA. Now, the ambiguity concerning football present in the early years has continued into present day. And while playing football was not considered impermissible in itself by religious scholars, 
watching football was considered as more complicated. Among Saudi religious scholars, the biggest concern uh, seemed to be that football is a waste of time, something that distracts you from more important things, and the exposure of body parts of the main player that should be concealed, so in particular the tie, um, considering short shorts. The question of women's football must be, seen, must be seen in relation to these broader debates about the meaning of football. Among the major contentious issues relating to football in the kingdom is that of female fans. So during the World Cup in 2014, for example, big screens was put up um, showing the games uh, only to be taken down in the city of Mecca out of fear that women and men would mix in relation to watching the screen. When, in 2018, stadiums were opened to female fans for the first time, this was also following years and years of debate. I took this picture actually at the football game in 2014, so four years before women were officially allowed entrance. But, um, and Hillel was playing a Saudi, you know, an Australian team, and so the Australian team was allowed to bring uh, women fans. Uh, I'm not an Australian, but they didn't get a lot of Australian fans to come over on such short notice, so they had some open spots. Um, <clears throat> but the argument then, and in this period, was that these stadiums licensed for males only. They didn't have the facilities to accommodate women with the local regulations for gender segregation. Nevertheless, when the final decision was made public in 2017, women would now be allowed into the stadiums. Stadiums were refurbished to accommodate women through so-called family sections within months. So, in many states around the world, women's association football has in fact been banned. This includes, for example, France, Brazil, and the UK, big football nations, and until the 1970s. In Saudi Arabia, football was never directly illegal, but uh, effectively outlawed through a number of restrictions and regulations, some specifically targeting women's sports, uh, and some more general. So for example, the infamous Guardian system, which was a mishmash of laws, regulations, and social norms, the driving ban and the enforced gender segregation placed restrictions on women's mobility more generally and access to public spaces and activities and therefore also the opportunities to practice sports. Physical education was not part of the curricula in public girls' schools as it was for boys and sports facility facilities were licensed as male only while there was no path to obtaining a license for women's gym or sports clubs. Though some gyms did operate under a different uh, license or with no license at all, uh, such as as a beauty parlor or as a physiotherapy center. But these gyms were few and they were very expensive, thus catering more to elite women than anyone else. In government documents, sports was included in the chapter of Youth, but this in practice referred to male youth. In the 2010 plan, women's sports are mentioned for the first time, following a section on sports in general, meaning men's sports, and noting need for athletic opportunities for females within the appropriate framework of the social values of the kingdom. In media statements, authorities provided ambiguous sometimes also contradictory statements about women's sports and girls' physical education. And then there were some more direct obstacles to organized sports, um, which includes reactions by the so-called Committee for the Promotion of uh, Virtue and the Prevention of Vice, which is the so-called moral police or religious police, Tawa, Haya, many names uh, that I'm sure you've heard about. But also difficulties with finding available spaces, so football fields, funding for renting these spaces, or for um, football attire. 
um, coaches or referees, and that sport itself was perceived as unacceptable for them. But, and this is at the core of my talk, women were still active. They found ways to play, practice sports, or stay healthy more generally. Some played with family and friends in private settings, while many private schools did offer physical education also for girls. And as mentioned, some found ways to open gyms. A number of grassroots initiatives existed, in addition to the football clubs, such as, for example, running and biking groups and basketball teams. So despite the lack of official opportunities, Creating more opportunities for women's sports was discussed frequently in, I'd say, before and after 2010, so like the last 10 years before the reforms started to happen, maybe also before. Um, these debates took place both in the media but also in the Shura Council that um, advised for opening uh, women's sports centers. These public discussions, as they appeared inside the newspapers in this period, including arguments by both supporters and opponents of women's and girls' physical activity, took place exclusively within an Islamic framework. So, what is right in Islam? How does this relate, relate to the religion? As opposed to, for example, a more right-based line of argument. In reports in the mainstream media, the reporting often rested on the premise that sport for women is something positive, and it is the opponents who are in the position of defending their position. Again and again, report, reports suggest that women's sports centers or PE classes in girls' public schools are impending, about to open. Alternatively, reports highlight sports related events for women and girls that already have taken place grassroots organized events and discuss the positive and negative reactions that these have provoked. So considering that the government did not issue a license to operate sports club for women before 2017, this might be a little bit surprising uh, and one should or could assume that the religious establishment was clear and coherent in rejecting this idea, but this was not the case, not at all. So those perpetuating positive views on introducing women's sports, uh, they included a plethora of personalities, including, for example, um, the head of the Committee for uh, the Promotion of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice. I sometimes mix them up, and that's very important, <laughs> um, in Mecca. While the discussions broadly center around whether or not physical education and or sports centers for women and girls are permissible in Islam, four core themes recurred in these debates. The first is international competition. Often media reports raise the issue of women's and girls' sports participation to international competition, and elsewhere it is the opponents making this connection. A focus on international competitions, such as the Olympics, and away from physical education in girls' schools, for example, or dedicated sports centers for women, facilitates an argument that women's sports is in breach with the established norms concerning women's behavior and appearances, and particularly exposure. The second and the most important argument for proponents is health and physical well-being. So proponents emphasize the benefits of physical activity and relates these to growing problems with obesity and lifestyle-related illnesses in the Saudi population. And thirteen is women's role in society and how sports fit into this. Those opposing women's sports participation see the opportunities to practice sports in a way that is in conflict, it's not in conflict with the role in society or moral obligations as difficult, if not impossible. So most often this relates to exposure of the body and the obligations to wear covering Islamic attire, in particular the Saudi Abaya, which is difficult to practice sports in. Other issues include the, the fear that sports would lead to women mixing with men or being exposed to men. Uh, 
uh, some again are concerned about women's chastity and suggest that while walking is safe, other sports can, for example, lead to losing the virginity. Finally, what we can call the domino effect. Now, this is related to the theme of international competition, and it is common among opponents of women's and girls' access to organized sporting activities and other forms of physical activity. The argument is that one thing will eventually lead to another, and that exposure of the female body, for example, is ultimately inevitable, as sports participation will lead to demands to compete in international competitions. While opponents of infrastructure to facilitate for women's and girls' sports and physical activity did acknowledge the importance of maintaining a healthy body in the slum, the benefits of infrastructure allowing for such activities did not, in their view, balance out the dangers associated with it. So the struggle for women in football, either as fans or as players, is a part of a broader struggle over the meanings of football, what values underpin football, and who gets to say. At a level, this is also not only a reflection of broader related ideological and political struggles in society, but also intervene with these. So the struggle to play football is also a struggle over women's role in society and the football field is a side where this struggle plays up. So, <clears throat> it was against this staff backdrop then that in January 2008, women's football team, uh, a women's football team from Real, traveled to the eastern province to play another team uh, of women in what would be the first women's football match inside the kingdom. The young women, university students at the time, had found a shared interest in playing football. In line with customary norms and regulations, the university, which was attended by both male and female students, was segregated. And the male campus had an indoor gym, and the women managed to persuade the staff to let them use the gym for a couple of hours every now and then. Soon, Al Mama Football Club was founded. The team shortly realized that as Riyadh's first women's football club, there was not much competition to be found. So wanting to take the team to the next level, they started searching for possible opponents and soon discovered there was another football team made up by students in another university in the eastern province. The two teams agreed on setting up a game with the support from their universities. Attracting a large number of female spectators, the event was later described as a success by those attending. For the players, it was an experience they would never forget. At full time, the score was 2-2. As the organizers had not discussed what would happen in the case of a draw beforehand, um, players and referees convened and agreed to play overtime in order to declare a winning team. After overtime, and then the subsequent penalty shootout, Ali Mama Football Club returned to Riyadh as the winner of the first women's football match in Saudi Arabia. In the days that followed, it became clear that the support for the events was not shared by everyone. An opinion piece in the Saudi daily newspaper suggested that the game was a popular topic in many gatherings following these events, with most commentators opposing it. On various online forums, reports circulated that the government of the Eastern Province received several letters from religious conservatives opposing the female women's football match. Despite assurances from the principal that the match was held in a private environment, the report suggested that the Committee for Promotion of Virtue and Prevention of Vice had found young men gathering in connection to the event. The response came as a surprise to the players, but quitting was not an option. And years later, reminiscing about the infancy of the league, the players said they got in trouble after the game, but, and I quote her, our passion made us continue with all the obstacles. The return game was played in, I wouldn't say secrecy, but in quiet. So, in 2008, after Alay Mama had encouraged other women to form football team, the Riyadh Women's Football League, an unofficial initiative by the teams themselves, was launched in Riyadh. 
eight teams announced their participation in the first season. And the league was organized by the players themselves, taking turns as the home team responsible for finding a pitch and taking turns of being referees. None of the players had any professional experience. Their qualifications were simply hours of watching football on the television and playing with friends and family. Their motivation was their passion for the game and their eagerness to play, not just for fun, but adding a competitive level. Despite this motivation, a number of issue, issues appeared, making it very challenging to play in an organized manner. First, with no history of organized football for women, there was no female coaches to recruit from. Some teams resorted to male coaches, which was kept secret considering the local laws and regulations of gender segregation. And many women educated themselves through YouTube or material brought from abroad to function themselves as coaches for their teams. Another issue was difficulties in finding fields to play, uh, to play on, considering the lack of venues licensed for women at the time. Due to the legal gray areas of letting the women play, many managers did not want to rent their fields to women, and this was especially the case for competitions, um, tournaments that would attract more attendees than a practice. Some families of the players let the teams borrow fields on their private property, but generally renting football fields was expensive, or the field was in poor condition. Open football fields, those that would not provide a secure gender segregation environment, would not be an option for most. So formally, there was no women's sports in Saudi Arabia which affected the opportunities for material and financial support. Sponsorship was hard to obtain, a sponsor would demand visibility. Although some of the teams managed to get agreements with some of the gyms operating without a proper license to train fitness for free in the facilities, so they were kind of like establishing a network of informal women's sports here. But as a general rule, players paid for the equipment themselves, though some teams received um, some donations also. And every year in this period, between six and eight teams have participated in the league, and the most active clubs have been important driving forces in keeping the activity up and expanding their respective clubs, adding new activities every year. So the two teams that has been central in keeping the league going and participated since the start, as mentioned, are Alemama and Challenge. Alemama, the team that played the first game in 2008, was started already in 2017, and the oldest team throughout in the aftermath of the first game and the reactions. The team actually separated from the university and found new ways to continue their activities. The experience made it clear that too much attention could cause a backlash, and other ways could be more productive in terms of creating opportunities for women to play and creating awareness about women's football. So therefore, instead of slowing down, after facing reactions, the women found new ways of strengthening their teams. And I'll get into that now through the case of the Mama Challenge and exemplify some of the ways women work towards greater acceptance and greater opportunities for those interested, interested in playing. So the women of the Mama team trained themselves to become better players before they realized they wanted competition to match themselves against. One of the founders estimated uh, that at the time of their foundation, she would believe that about 98% of society would disapprove of their activities. But despite this, they soon found other women answering their call to establish teams. Alia Mama prepared guidelines to other groups of women on how to start their team, and soon there were more teams to be out to play against and shortly after the uh, women's football league was established. Ten years later, in 2017, when I was in New York doing my field work, the team had expanded far beyond this. They are no longer only one team, but the women of the first team also coaches a football academy for children down to the age of four. New activities had been added every year uh, to secure the steady growth of the club. Since 2014, the mass had been increasing, first from younger girls. So the mama responded to these requests by establishing a team for girls from the age of 12. 
Later, parents started asking for teams for even younger children, and that's when the academy opened. Wanting to give back to the community, the team decided um, to set up a football, this football academy, um, despite the workload that comes with it. So most of these, or all of these, uh, players are voluntary. This resulted in a collaboration with a nonprofit organization, and Alimama has since run its football program. Again, there was no coaching classes available at least at this time, so all of these women are self-taught. And when I visited in 2017, more than 70 kids were participating, and there were still requests coming in, even though the academy was completely full. Uh, for females, Ali Mama had no upper age limit, catering to children, young girls, and adult women, but boys are only allowed until the age of 12, in respect of Saudi traditions and regulations for gender segregation, and the management of the academy prioritized providing opportunities for girls and women, um, since these were the opportunities that they themselves did not have growing up. And playing football remains the main activity to this academy, but the group takes also a holistic approach, aiming to build personality and normalize women's football for their children growing up today. This is a specific argument behind teaching football to girls and boys together uh, from a young age and up until the age of 12, according to one of the founders. Because through normalizing women, women playing football, all coaches are women, uh, building on the idea that these boys will be more likely to support girls playing football in the future. So you can say a form of social engineering. By bringing boys and girls together, breaking with the segregation norm, Alemama seeks to demystify interaction between kids of different genders and teach the boys that it is normal for girls to play football. And as one of the founders told me during my field work, uh, and I quote, years of years of facing a lot of obstacles, of facing a lot of issues and constraints, we realized, we feel since we were pioneers in girls football in Riyadh, or in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, that we are to pave the way for the next generation and to give back to the community. So by setting up the voluntary kids program and seeking to normalize girls playing football among the next generation, Ali Amama takes their perceived social responsibility and sees not only to provide opportunities that they did not have, but to influence the harsh minds of the communities. And the other team that has been active since the start is Challenge. This team used together to play as friends since, I think, 2005 and decided to form a team after being approached by Ali Amama in 2007. They shared an interest in playing competitively and soon got serious about their practice. Although always keeping space for those who just wanted to attend for fun or was an experience and wanted to try something new. So in practice, this meant that to cater for all levels, Challenge had in 2017 divided their team into different levels, A level, B level, C level, they also expanded to include a basketball team at the time and considered engaging in organizing an even broader range of events. Among the players, some took their engagement with football increasingly seriously and traveled to attend conferences and courses outside of Saudi Arabia long before football was officially available for women and girls. One of the founders become the, became the first female licensed football coach in Saudi Arabia after completing a course in another country. So globalization and technolo technological developments have made it a lot easier for women to obtain the necessary equipment for playing, information on how to train or how to coach, and to create and manage local and international networks. With the government's change of attitude towards women in sports, was highlighted by the appointment of Princess Rima in 2016 as vice president in the sports authorities. The existing teams have increased their social media presence, taking the opportunity to advertise games or provide contact information for curious women wanting to join the team. And when the sports authorities started licensing, licensing women's sports groups, 
which also allow, looks like challenge to formally register. This brought new opportunities to be visible and advertise their activities, attracting more players to the teams. And according to the teams themselves, a lot of um, the number of players increased a lot in this period. So, in slightly different ways, both of these teams have balance pushing for their cause while also avoiding to provoke um, action against their activities. Recruitment, for example, before 2017 usually happened through the word of mouth or through the players' network. And some teams have stayed away from media completely. Others have made sure to be careful in their messaging if appearing in media, including the official messaging. So this means, for example, uh, to wear the wig, uh, include, including often a mask as a form of face wearing, since you can have a sports mask that it easier to play with than in a cup, uh, or posting pictures only with the players uh, on a safe distance, like here. Um, the same goes for social media. Such tactics, tactics are employed both by the team collectively, but also as individuals. So although both Challenge and their colleagues in Alimama wanted to see changes in the field of women's football in Saudi Arabia, they focused on awareness and building strong organizations rather than confrontational campaigning in order not to provoke any backlash from society that might do more harm than good for their cause. They have focused on steady growth and creating opportunities for an increasing number of people and constantly working on taking advantage of expanding opportunities. For Challenge, it has indeed been an outspoken goal to build a strong organization with talented females prepared to take the lead when the social and political situation allow for it. And as I mentioned, many of these players had played sports with uh, their families, their brothers, cousins growing up, all had support from their immediate families. And I should note here also that most of these grassroots sports clubs uh, did not welcome women and girls to join if they were hiding it from their parents. So those who might not have supportive families for the most part did also not participate. At the same time, many players hid their activities from extended family or uh, their employers, not knowing how they would react or fearing that they might oppose to them playing football. Those involved in organized football also told me that they had the support of the king and the government, and that it was the so-called society, an abstract idea of people's general opinion or the conservatives, an influential group of people that was the ones opposing women's sports. The team also consciously avoided attracting too much publicity uh, to avoid, as mentioned, a potential backlash. And this strategy was explicit, and it was based on their experience. So backlash that could happen would, for example, be parents withdrawing their daughters, landlords canceling rental agreements for fields, or matches being shut down by authorities. Again, in, in particular, um, the fear was about the committee for uh, promoting virtue and preventing vice. From around 2017, many teams started to be more visible as they experienced that the government was now vocally supporting women's sports and thus providing some form of protection, and in particular, again, this was after the appointment of uh, Rima bin Pander in the sports authorities. This exposed players to negative and hateful comments in social media. Comparing the interviews I did in 2014 and then in 2017, statements from players had gone from what believing that women's football would sometime in the future be official. Um, <clears throat> So from uh, society is not ready, as one would say. And the change would come slowly and gradually to, as one player put it, maybe society was ready all along. 
this all points to how there was perhaps a gap between what people thought people thought about women's sports and what people actually thought about women's sports. This relates, of course, to the lack of clear policies in the field and to the government's shifting and contradictory uh, communication. Throughout, the women footballers did not focus on the limitations, but rather on the possibilities on how to make women's football more acceptable to society. It was, after all, the effects of the sports that was considered unacceptable, not the sport itself. So now, seven years since the players shared these ambitions and concerns, the situation has changed even more. Both teams are still active. Um, in 2019, a first smaller version of an official tournament was held, while the next year, a nationwide tournament was held. And in 2021 and 22, a full nationwide league has been played. This development was hindered a little bit by the COVID pandemic, but the development has been pretty um, gradual uh, or ongoing. Uh, since the fall of 2022, there has been a full national wide league, as I mentioned, under the Saudi Football Federation. And this year, this league was actually for the first time televised. Saudi Arabia now has a women's football team competing in international competition that was ranked by FIFA for the first time this spring. So Challenge and Alimama are both playing in the top divisions as part of other teams, as I mentioned. And the success of these teams surely highlight how important they have been for laying the groundwork for women's football in Saudi Arabia. While previous regulations created barriers, the women of these teams succeeded in establishing women's football in Saudi Arabia, sowing the seeds for the future. When the changes came about, faster and sooner than uh, faster and sooner uh, than the women had expected when I met them in 2017, and certainly 2014, when I first encountered these teams, they secured that the talent, experience, networks, and structures for these reforms to succeed was somewhat established already. So many of the women who have been volunteering, building up women's football from nothing for years, are today part of the organizations in charge of the official football. And what I have presented here today are only two of the ways that women themselves have been actively driving change. By challenging the gender expectations of football as strictly male domain, and insisting that women have their place as fans and players, they are not only contesting hegemonic ideas within Saudi football, but within society as a whole. Ali Mama and Challenge has focused on building awareness and normalizing women's and girls' participation in football, preparing the next generation for the times to come. They have done this through years and years of work before any sport came about from above. Many similar initiatives exist in football, in other sports, and in other spheres in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, in addition to more confrontational activities. This highlight the need for acknowledging women's agency as a driver in processes of change. In recent years, and in relation to the increased attention given to state-led initiatives in sports among the Gulf countries, particularly Qatar and the World Cup, Saudi Arabia has also increasingly made the headlines with these accusations of sports washing. And this term, sports washing, this concept refers to states seeking to wash their bad human rights records by bringing attention to sports. Um, examples, for example, um, Saudi Arabia's birth purchase of Newcastle football club, um, hosting large sporting events, or acquiring top international players to the Saudi Pro League. But also improvements and opportunities for women's sports have been included in this narrative, suggesting that opening venues and establishing teams for women is a way of sports washing. Now, there might very well be a value from these reforms to the, to the public relations of the of Saudi Arabia and other countries. But this narrative also excludes this year-long effort of women themselves involved in building the foundation for increased 
education is in women's sports. When the Sport for All Federation announced the first women's football tournament in 2019, and this was very much presented as the first of its kind, and later first has been represented in similar manners. No reference to what was already there has been made. To some degree, pioneering women have been celebrated as the first, but this focus on the first can also contribute to the impression that it's something unusual, deviating from the normal, which was nothing. As an authoritarian state, the Saudi government very much seeks to take the credit for the increased opportunities for women, leaving little praise for those who laid the foundation. And in international media, or I think particularly European media at least, a similar narrative arises either in its praising or criticizing of reforms. Often the women and their agency are underplayed or put in the background. Ultimately then, this enforced the image of Saudi women as objects to their surroundings, neglecting their agency and their role in their societies. And this is not to underestimate the power of the Saudi state, um, but a reminder to look beyond the headlines and to consider the importance of a society and its people and the story is often overlooked. Women struggle to play and to be taken seriously as part of the football community. Challenge dominant ideas about who holds the ownership to and power to define football in claiming their place as players and supporters in the overall story of football. They are not only challenging the dominant ideas in football culture, but reflecting the ongoing struggle in society over women's role. And in the end, the struggle for women's rights in football is also one of women's rights more generally. So finally, to understand the seemingly immediate success of women's football in Saudi Arabia, and I mean this in terms of the very rapid development and extensive expansion, recruiting a large number of players and professionals on all levels, one must consider the long history of Saudi women's football and the years of work put down by women pioneers. In other words, the very state-centric narrative of change that is the focus of both authorities and critics obscures the efforts of local pioneers that have worked for years to establish a foundation for women's football and has succeeded in doing so, providing skill and structure. As one woman said when I interviewed her, years ago, when it finally becomes official, we will be ready. Thank you. Um, yeah, are you, are you willing to take questions? Of course. Okay. Um, you talked a little bit about this um, earlier, at the, towards the beginning of your presentation. Um, about how like the perceptions of women's sports participation like pre-2017 um, and like who kind of fostered that and um, was that like a big theme for educators and in schools and stuff like did a lot of teachers kind of like help promote that um, like for like to have those like physical education programs in schools but also like support it for like extracurricular activities mm. that's a great question I think is the short answer. I, I don't know. Um, I've been looking at the media discourse and also I know that the Shura Council um, was an important people uh, or some people important to raising this issue the Shura Council, which is a consultative council in say of Saudi Arabia consulting the government and policies. Um, but these were often those sites were often like already prominent uh, people in the Saudi public. Um, what I do know is that it varied greatly what opportunities were actually there. Uh, so in some schools, a teacher might, you know, be eager to kind of engage in some kind of physical activity with the students, providing some opportunities. Uh, and I, there's absolutely likely that you had these kind of, uh, um, should I call them actors, uh, who worked on a very like, small scale, uh, individual level. Uh, but I don't know much about it, unfortunately. 
I can come kind of comment on that because I lived in Saudi like pre twenty seventeen, um, and so like it depended it depends on like the school and the funding. So like, I went to like an international school for a while, so we would play sports with like other international schools across like the nation. Mm. But like the more government or like the public schools, it would depend on like their funding and like their um, teachers. So it's kind of like exactly what you said. Like some mm. of the bigger schools in like the bigger cities would still have those. Um, like educators that would really want to like have sports, and they would reach out to us as like the international schools to like set up games and things like that. But some of the smaller ones and like the smaller cities would just you know, they may want to have that kind of opportunity. And also at the I did some work on this in, in Qatar, where I looked specifically at university, so in higher education, uh, where football was organized as a more as a grassroots initiative and not part of the university structures because. It, these structures didn't cater to the women's uh, needs. And that was very much an alliance between engaged people in the administration and students. We had like some kind of like, um, I don't know how to say it much, but um, primary motors or drivers among the individuals in the administration as well. Um, are religious leaders in Saudi Arabia they think with pretty much the same frame of mind in relation to like women in football, or are they split based on like Quranic thought or views? So I think especially now that's very hard to say because of the level of authoritarianism, uh, especially control over relig religious intellectual people and scholars. Uh, it also de depends on the definition. The, the defi in a sense because you have you have people who are prominent Islamic scholars who was very pro women's sports who was speaking for women's sports uh, but then you had uh, some such as the uh, Bin Bas, the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia for a long time uh, he was very skeptical uh, in his writings about this and I think what the general impression was to me was that uh, it was often religious influential people within the state structure. So, for example, in the Ministry of Education, uh, that would disrupt to any plans on introducing physical education. But there was not one voice, I would say, uh, just from analyzing media. But that's mainstream media, and I think maybe if you look specifically, again, future research, take that ball and run, <laughs> whoever wants. Um, uh, to look specifically in more Islamic uh, papers or magazines, um, maybe it's different. Okay. Thank you. Um, you talked about football clubs that were established before it was even like legal or okay. So had these teams gotten like caught or like found out, would there have been punishments or repercussions, like the Flames, for example? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question, and um, I think, I mean, one of the problem, problems with authoritarianism is the arbitrariness as well, right? So this kind of lingering fear that of what could happen is kind of what controls the activity or controls um, what people are doing or what they feel that they can do. And with sports, there was this kind of like, yeah, the, as I said, contradictory messaging, uh, it wasn't completely clear what was uh, the boundaries, like what could you do and what could you not do. And especially in these areas that were some, I mean, in practice controlled by the so-called religious police, uh, the Committee for Promoting Virtue and Advice, um, where it wasn't completely clear when they would uh, react. And so what could happen, for example, was that they could come and shut down an event if they thought that this was breaching with the social norms of the kingdom. There wasn't a rule that said like this many spectators or I mean the general <coughs> segregation element of course but in general just creating too much fuss. Um, but what was people that I spoke to was more and more concerned about was that if there would be a lot of noise around this then parents would withdraw their the permission for to attend. So that was the basic line. Like, if 
if this creates too much attention, too much discussion, um, there's a certain fear about what could happen, would it be shut down, then um, parents uh, wouldn't, wouldn't support the, their daughter's playing anymore. Uh, so that was kind of like the major thing uh, from what I And I, I, I mean, I, I speak to, right, I speak on this and sometimes people get the wrong idea and think, to jail or whatever, I think that's very far from what they were actually doing, that that was even um, at that time uh, a question, but um, but more of these, kind of like the families withdrawing support, or landlords renting out fields withdrawing support, donors. Oh yeah, um, this, this is actually a perfect transition too. So in slide 12, uh, you mentioned uh, about the opportunities um, that you know usually when you ask parents or um, you know relatives, everyone has to be supportive basically. So my question would be, um, how equally spread is this support among different social and socioeconomic classes in Saudi Arabia? Because my thinking, at least you know, and obviously so. My, my hypothesis is, right, it's, it's more spread towards sort of, you know, you know the higher uh, socioeconomic standing. Uh, perhaps parents are more, uh, you know, willing to allow their daughters to play. But, you know, if you go towards maybe more rural regions or, you know, it would be sort of less well spread so you don't get, you know, equal participation rates from all populations, thus limiting the potential to find, you know, those those hidden talents um, within the population. So so what what is your experience on, on that front? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And, um, so first of all, when they started doing these kind of events, like family events for girls to play sports, uh, those officialized folks were actually surprised about how high the level of attendance were around the kingdom, also in rural areas. So there might be more um, support than what one would expect. I think it, I mean, geography is one thing, uh, class is another, um, but also there's a lot of differences within the kingdom uh, in terms of regions. Riyadh is different than Jeddah, than the Mam, um, and also the level of education or kind of like globalization. A lot of Saudis studied abroad, and in, especially in American universities, and they did Sports, so you have, I think you have a variety of mindsets, and um, something that I think is interesting um, to think about when you ask that question is, uh, okay, just to step back for a second, because class is definitely a big thing, especially before there was any official structures, because it was self-funded, right? And mobility was also more easily accessible for higher class women, because you needed a driver basically or someone to drive you around to go to practice and to go to games and this is a very time consuming activity so they were training four times a week you know um, but what I, I wanted to say was that this is very interesting now because the expansion happens so rapidly and now we have a televised league so one thing is how would these kind of in initiatives be uh, available to women of all different socioeconomic backgrounds uh, when they were still segregated and sheltered and safe and not publicized and you could kind of do it without uh, advertising it. Uh, your face wouldn't be part of it. Anything you could do, do it in, in theory with just your parents knowing and a lot of people did that, parents and friends. Uh, but who are you excluding when you are developing it in the way they're doing now? Started to like televise the game and push it, push it, push it, you know, as advertisement, uh, Twitter, the media, all of this. Um, so I don't know, I haven't been doing any research on that, but I definitely think that there's a concern that um, someone is left out when, you, when these teams are no longer secluded as they used to be. Um, maybe temporary, maybe. Problem. I don't know, but I think it's a, it's a very good question to think about, uh, especially now when we are all watching these developments. So, 
really sorry. That's yeah. a really interesting point because like we're seeing a little bit of this like in England with women's football, right? Where it used to be because training centers happen outside of the bigger cities, you might see more diversity. Uh, middle class or even lower class families may be able to take their, their their girls to these academies, these training centers. But now that they've moved under the rubric of you know these bigger clubs, training centers have moved to these better, bigger facilities within the cities, and then you're seeing less diversity in the academies. Mm -hmm. So that is an interesting point about what are the ramifications. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, just to continue on that before, I come to the next question, so uh, I also, in, um, in one of my articles on this, I also discuss a, uh, another team, Stars, which was uh, women of, with orphanage background. Um, so they had it easier in some ways because they didn't need the permission of the family. Uh, but on the other hand, they needed the permission of the state because the state was their guardian. So they had a whole different set of, of issues uh, and also relied on charitable. So I think it's, yeah, it's complex, um, but again, when there was only unofficial gyms operating, this were only available to the very top, um, yeah. Okay, uh, so you mentioned in one of the slides that, uh, that the shift that like happened from society was not ready to society was ready all along. Um, so the, like, do you expect, because this kind of fast shift that happened, do you expect uh, a rebel back in the community or even leaders within the government or just... Mm. Yeah, it's difficult to say because of the level of authoritarianism we have. There's a lot of people um, in jail in Saudi Arabia for expressing their opinions or having opinions that are expressing them. Um, related to these rapid developments. But I think also, you know, it's really hard to pinpoint if there was a majority or a minority that supported the Squash, but um, what we can fairly say is that there was a very uh, vocal and strong support for the Squash, whether they were a minority or a majority. And during these days, I mean, until, I don't know if any of you uh, that didn't live in Saudi Arabia at the time, to follow Saudi Arabia and, and the discourse in Saudi Arabia before 2017. But uh, we used to always hear this, that the king and the royal family were kind of the liberals, and the society was very conservative. And so the king and the royal family was kind of like the guard for uh, women's rights, but they, they had to do it in a, uh, like slowly and steady. Um, but no one actually really questioned the narrative. Like, is it really so? Because do we know? And it's hard to it's hard to see how popular these changes are, of course, because there's no reliable service. But um, a lot of people are thinking. So again, minority, majority, it's hard to say. But a lot of people are coming, and I've been to some of these events as well. Uh, sports events for women, for girls. There's a lot of women out there, for example, which we would expect are more conservative parts of society. So I think the question of any backlash or reactions is more a political question than you know, what can be observed very easily right now, because it's, it's a difficult political environment. So thank you so much because this was a great um, dive into it. Um, I really appreciate your focus on these pioneer women, their agency in this, because uh, one of the things that came out recently was this FIFA documentary on the Saudi international team, right? And there you see a lot of these players who are, and, and coaches talking about all that they had to go through, and you you kind of feel that you know that connection with them. Um, 
and I admit, at the back of my mind, I have this idea of, yeah, but this is still part of this bigger project of the of the government. This is all part of potentially sports washing or soft power or all these different terms. But um, <clears throat> one of the things that stands out to me there is I connected with those players in the same way I would with other sports documentaries like the Matildas, the Australian mm -hmm. women's team, or even something like the Wrexham team or whatever, right? Um, so I think one of the things I wanted to, to ask you about is this, this similarity between the growth of, or, or the, the expansion of women's football in Saudi to some of these other footballing countries like Brazil and England. Um, do you see much similarity there or you know, what are the differences, changes, challenges that are differenti differentiating between mm. these places? I can't speak too much about other contexts sure. and all the different pieces yeah, yeah. in Saudi Arabia and Qatar. But, um, but I think what is interesting is that um, people maybe tend to overlook the recent history of women's people in other countries as well. Like I mentioned briefly, and that's why I mentioned this, that it was actually banned until the 1970s in many countries. Uh, it was played and then prohibited and, and banned in a lot of countries. Like I looked up the list on Wikipedia or something, and it's like there was issues in like, all the countries, you know. Um, and so this has been a struggle that is global, um, and it's still going on. I mean, here I don't know too much about this. I'm sure someone else knows more about this. But you've had this struggle over wages uh, and payment, and the U.S. is still one of the few countries where football is really strong women's sports, uh, while it's so masculine and male-dominated elsewhere. Uh, so I think and when I'm speaking to women footballers in Qatar and Saudi Arabia, they see themselves as, you know, not as like the struggle to play in Saudi Arabia or Qatar is something very specific relating to, you know, the so-called patriarchal structures in these societies as something unique or exceptional, okay? Uh, but they see themselves as part of a global struggle. Uh, they kind of position themselves within this kind of like global or international fight for women's right to play. And they have some very specific uh, barriers or have had and very specific struggles within this larger struggle. Uh, but overall, they see themselves as part of a global community of women. Is full, prep is full professionalization on the horizon? for the Saudi league, do you think, for these players? It's hard to say these yeah. days, you know? Things are happening so fast. Um, I think, so, I did research on, on Qatar, and what's interesting in comparison is that um, Qatar founded their national women's team in 2010, the same year um, they applied for the World Cup. Uh, which is also similar to Saudi Arabia now applying for the World Cup. Um, so of course you need a women's team to apply for the World Cup, right? In Qatar, they didn't really do anything else. Uh, they tried to establish a league, or, but I really don't even know what happened with it. I was never able to find a game. Um, their women's team are no longer ranked by FIFA, and that relates to how many games you can play. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, the two countries can't be compared. They're very different in terms of population, in terms of size, uh, but also in terms of what was already there, where they were coming from. Uh, but in Saudi Arabia, they're seeing this very broadly. They're building, they're attempting to at least establish a good foundation with physical education, uh, with sports for all. They have a very economic view of this as well because it's it's a whole industry where fifty percent of the population are excluded, right? So I mean, in terms of motivation, it might be many things, but um, it's a massive development, and they're building structures in a very different way than Qatar did, for example, and they have the skilled women driving it inside the system. So I don't know, I mean, of course, you have aspects of public relations, uh, securing the World Cup, all of the 
these things. Uh, economy, super important driver. Uh, but I mean, in terms of how much is happening and, and how much they're pushing for change in a rapid pace within the sports, why not full professionalization? I don't know, but everything else is happening, so. Questions or things we want to raise? Okay, I think that's all for now, but thank you so much. So we will pick up again next week with uh, investigative journalist Karim Zidan, who will be here in person. Um, and I can't remember the topic of this talk. Oh, it's uh, the, hist the history of Saudi sports washing or something like that. So we'll continue along these themes. Picking up Brad. Exactly. <laughs>